Well, good morning. He is risen. If you're new to church and you've never heard that before, that's something the church often says in response to this good news of Easter. That Easter is not just a moment in time in the past, but it is still our present reality. That because of Easter, we have hope today. Our life today is different because he lives. But sometimes, for me, my life doesn't look very different. In fact, sometimes Easter is easily forgotten And I begin to be bogged down with this reality of just how messed up I am. I don't know how many pastors you know in your life, but let me tell you a secret. They're the worst. I promise. Every one of us, we are filled with sin and brokenness and sometimes laziness. And and sometimes we don't live the way we'd like to. In fact, we can sometimes be a bit of a disappointment or a letdown. Over the course of the next couple weeks, we're going to look at some of the expectations that you and I have of ourselves and of one another, and we're going to see just how much people let us down. Sound exciting? I think when we have realistic expectations of other people, we can begin to experience God's grace with them in a way we never have before. I was talking about this sermon series with somebody yesterday, and I was excited about the series, Let Down, and this mom stopped me and goes, please tell me it's not a series about breastfeeding. (laughs) Nope, that's not coming up in this sermon series anymore. So if that's what comes to your mind with Let Down, I'm sorry to let you down with our title. (laughs) But what does this Easter life look like for you and for me? What about our expectations of other people are healthy or unhealthy? More importantly, what about our expectations of ourselves? You see, one of my flaws is that sometimes I hold myself to an unrealistic expectation. I think I certainly should have learned by now from all my past mistakes, why do I keep doing them again? Or I look at my sin and I know what scripture says and I know what he's done. And I say, why do I keep going back to this sin that I know is so empty and broken? And I stand up here and sometimes wonder, why would you ever trust me to be in this role? Because, you know, the truth is, I can be my own worst critic. Can you? You have that conversation with somebody and you say something really stupid and it totally fails and you feel like an idiot. And for days or weeks, all you can think about when you see that person is the time you said the thing you wish you hadn't said. You're like, I bet that's all they think about too. They have no idea what you're talking about when you bring it up. Or those times when you look at your faith, you're like, am I not doing enough? Like, I'm reading the Bible sometimes, and then I get to Exodus or Leviticus, and it's confusing, so I stop pretty quickly. Or I'm, I'm praying when it's convenient. Like, I really want to know God. I truly desire him, and yet I get distracted by Netflix and by all these other things, and I rarely seek him. And sometimes we think to ourselves, if only the people around me knew who I was, I wouldn't be welcome here anymore. Today, as we are facing our expectations and the reality of Easter, we're going to begin with Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians is a letter Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he gives this profound encouragement at the beginning. Chapter 2, he says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul, he's writing and he tells them really encouragingly, you were dead in your sin. Like, picture that image. Oftentimes we think about our sin, that brokenness within us, those things we do that aren't so healthy or good for us or others. Oftentimes we think about that sin, we're like, it's not really that big. 
Like, I haven't killed anybody yet. There's still time, right? I haven't done the really bad stuff like those people. My sin's not that significant. And yet, Paul, he says, we were dead in our trespasses. You ever been around a dead person? How much can they do to bring life to themselves? With the exception of Jesus, nothing. Dead people remain dead. Paul, he says, you were dead in your trespasses. Your sin and my sin, all of the ways in which we fall short, all of the things that just don't measure up, leave us dead. And there's nothing we can do to fix that. No amount of prayer or Bible study or trying harder will help us come alive. He says, we were not only dead, we were following the ways of the prince of power of the air, a way of describing the devil himself. I bet you probably didn't come to church today thinking, you know, I bet pastor, he's going to tell me about how in my life I'm really just following the devil in everything I do. But the truth is every single time we sin, which a little secret for you if you don't know is pretty much constantly, every single time we think or we say or we do something that brings harm to another or to ourself, it's following the ways of the devil. And we are dead. Paul says, among whom we once all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. See, when we follow the ways of this world, the course of this world, the work of the devil, when we follow after our sinful transgressions and the things that seem all right, this is what he says. He says, we were pursuing the passions of our body and our mind, the desires of our flesh. That doesn't sound so bad, right? Well, what makes you happy? That's good for you. What feels good to you? Just go for it. But while we were pursuing those things, we were like children of wrath, doomed to judgment. But God. I love those two words of Paul's. But God. You see, the truth is all of our sin and brokenness and failings, all of the times we don't measure up, there is nothing that we can do to overcome it. And if you stop to think about it for a moment, this can be really discouraging. Your relationships that are struggling, the people you love who are pulling away, dead. Martin Luther was once asked about the reality of sin. If you don't know who that is, he's a pastor from about 500 years ago. And this pastor was really convicted with these passages and this reality of what comes next. And he was asked about sin. If everything we do is sin, what should we do? And he gives this really profound and often misquoted answer. Sin boldly so that grace may abound. And he goes on to clarify, he doesn't mean just like keep doing those things that are harmful, it'll be okay. No, see, every time the devil reminds us of our shortcomings and our failures and all the ways we don't measure up, look him square in the face and say, you are right. But God, but God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. See, because he lives, you and I have been made alive. While we look all of our shortcomings in the face, we look in the mirror, we see how we don't measure up. Or that self-talk, that negativity that says, you blew it again. Come on, why can't you get this right? All of that failure. But God, being rich in his mercy, gives us grace and has made us alive together with Christ. 
When I was in seminary, one of my professors asked a question that we all thought was super easy. What is the most important job of a pastor? Oh, this will be simple, right? We've done four years of schooling. We know the answer. And we began to answer one after the next. It's to preach God's word. Nope. It's to lead the church, to teach people how to live correctly. It's, and we started naming all these things until finally we ran out of options and said, we don't know. What is the most important job of a pastor? And this professor of mine said, you have one job and one job only. Like Superman, you have a power to forgive people of their sins. Not a power that I uniquely have, but we as the church have. And you guys have said, please forgive us of our sins. And so I do. So the only thing you should be concerned with is when somebody is filled with, with shame or guilt or doubt or fear or regrets and all the pain of all their sins and all their brokenness, when that rears its ugly head, don't try to fix it. Don't try to show them how to make it better. Just forgive them. And we're all like, oh, okay, that's simple. Of course you would say that's our job. No big deal, right? But what does this look like? To be forgiven. Well, that very same professor in a different class, uh, I had just had our second, well, I didn't have, my wife had our second child. I was there for it. Um, tried to help as much as I could and found myself really unable to adjust to the life of two children. And I found myself really stressed and overworked and overwhelmed. And I got a little behind in some of my coursework. And I don't know about you, but for me, when I get stressed and behind, I get really, really good at procrastinating. I'll do that later tonight. Okay, I'll do that early in the morning, later tomorrow. And my procrastination just kept piling up further and further. And I had one assignment, just one, for his class. And the end of the quarter came, and I hadn't completed this assignment yet to turn in. And then the end of the two-week break came, and I still hadn't completed that assignment. And he sent me an email and said, Adam, I'm going to submit an incomplete. If you don't get this into me, it'll become a failure. And that just added more to the stress. And every time I sat down to write this assignment, every time I sat down to do what I knew I needed to do, I was so overcome with this guilt and shame, like, I am terrible. How can I become a pastor when I can't even write one assignment? Like, is this really the kind of guy that a church needs to lead them? And I would stare at an empty screen for hours. And that pressure of just how much I wasn't able to write a stupid paper just kept building. And finally, four weeks into the new quarter, six weeks after it was due, I submitted this assignment. And he said, because you're so late, I've got to knock you a couple of letter grades, but because you got it turned in, you did well enough. The rest of the class, you'll still pass. It'll be okay. And I was so relieved. Hey, this is good. I passed. And yet that inner monologue, Adam, how dare you? Could you really do such a thing? Like, it's just a simple thing like a paper, but he deserves better. You deserve better. You can do better. Come on, Adam. And I just beat myself up with this guilt and this shame and this regret. So I sent him an email and said, hey, I'd really like to talk to you about this paper. Can we meet? Sure. Come on by an hour before class and we'll sit and talk. So I come on by his office. And I've come prepared with this great and long speech of repentance. I'm so sorry. This was so terrible. I'm such a horrible person. You deserve better. This was dishonoring. All of these things I wanted to get off my chest. And I sat down in his office. and was like, what would you like to talk about? And I said, I'm just really sorry for being so late. And before I could even finish the rest of what I was thinking, he just looked me in the eyes and said, Adam, you are forgiven. Anything else? What? You are forgiven. Anything else? Well, I guess not. Okay, I'll see you in class. And that was it. What I thought would be a long conversation took about a minute and a half. You are forgiven. Anything else? It'll be okay. He continues, you have been 
made alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You see, you and I can very easily look at our guilt and our shame and our shortcomings and all of our failure and expect that we should do better. I know I can be more than this, but this is where I am. I know I could do better, but I continue not to. But this is what we need from God. You are forgiven. Anything else? You see, Paul, he writes, by grace we've been saved. And that's a word in the church that's used that sometimes can be overused and we under-understand. By grace means this, something you don't deserve. Something you can't earn. Something freely given, not under compulsion, but out of love. Something immeasurably better than what you could ever hope for on your own. By this, you have been saved. Not you will be if only you get it right this time. Not you will be if only you don't make that mistake next time. Not you will be as soon as you start to believe you're worth it. No, by this gift you can't earn, you have already been saved. And this is our hope. The immeasurable riches of his grace. That he can show us that over and over and over again. You are forgiven. Anything else? And then he goes on. And we could stop right here, but he continues with what I think is just so encouraging. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. In some translations it says we are his masterpiece. When you look in the mirror, do you see a masterpiece of God? Or do you see a piece of work? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When you find yourself expecting more of yourself and that inner monologue, that self-talk that's defeating and says, you're not enough, you should do better, try harder, get it right this time. Why can't you stop that sin? Remember this, you are his masterpiece, not yours. You are his good work, created for good works. God's not asking you, because of Easter and the resurrection, to be perfect going forward. He's not asking you to try harder and do more. He's telling you, you are a masterpiece. Deal with it. And so when you find yourself beating yourself up with shame and regret and doubt and confusion, and fear, and anxiety, overwhelmed by the weight of your shortcomings, and that inner monologue says nothing positive, and you begin to perceive everybody else thinks the same. You are his masterpiece. So sin boldly. Not as one who goes and sins because it doesn't matter, but as one that every single time you do, you can be reminded he has already saved you. He's already forgiven you. And out of that place of forgiveness, because you're forgiven, because it's not about getting it right and being perfect and fixing your mess, because you don't have to try harder, out of that place, we're able to begin to do the good works that he's prepared for us. Again, they're not the good works we create they are things he's prepared. And so each and every day we look in the mirror and we see our shortcomings and our failures and just how much we feel let down by our own inability. 
You say, but God, you are enough. But God, you've declared in spite of this, I'm somebody new. You have forgiven me. And so in our Easter hope, we are free to stop expecting to get it all right. To stop beating ourselves up when we fail. And we are free instead to be forgiven. That's it. So what are the things that you don't like about yourself? Is it the way you run to overeating when you're anxious or nervous? The way you cut people down when you're angry or hurt? The way you build up walls that you don't know how to tear down because you're afraid? What if you let those people in? What are the ways that you aren't enough? Hear this today. You are forgiven. Anything else? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. You've created us for good works. But Lord, we can only live in that life you've given to us when we first allow ourselves to be sinful and broken people. When we let ourselves down and we are filled with shame and regret. God, it's only in you that we have new life and are raised up and seated with Christ. So God, I pray every time we fall short and feel like we're not enough, that your grace would be sufficient, that you would speak a better word. When our shortcomings come against us, God, would we look them in the face and say, yes, but God, being rich in mercy, has made us alive. And God, I ask that we would be strengthened today to stop expecting us to get it right and to fix it this time, but strengthened to go and love and serve and forgive because we've been forgiven. In Jesus' name we pray.